14, 15, 16, we grew, you know, four to 12 million. We kind of stayed at 12 million for a year or two, just because we kept outgrowing our space. And we, it was just my husband and I, it was our money, you know, so like. Welcome to the My Wife Quitter Job podcast. Today, I have Tori Gerbig on the show. And Tori and I were recently featured on the Ashley Banfield show, where we shared some tips on how to start an online business. And Tori is the founder of PinkLily.com, which is a nine-figure business that sells clothing and boutique fashion. Now, Pink Lily hit the multi-million dollar mark, and it's grown to a business of over 200 employees. And what I actually admire more is that she is a mother of three, and she works with her husband, just like I do with my wife in our business. And in this episode, we are going to uh, find out exactly how she did it. And with that, welcome to the show. Tori, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me on today. Yeah, you know, Tori, so I actually teach a class on e-commerce, and what I always tell people is that clothing is actually one of the hardest types of products to sell online. Absolutely. So I'm just very curious how you got started. So it kind of was by accident. Um, I went to school for marketing and sales, not fashion. Um, Come 2012, we were just really struggling and could not make ends meet. So we started selling items on eBay and Etsy. And started out with very random products. I'm talking like golf clubs, um, USB hard drives, random stuff. And um, it did pretty well. We sold items on eBay and Etsy for about a year, year and a half. And then fast forward to 2013, I was pregnant with my son, looking over my benefits, my maternity leave options, and freaking out about having unpaid maternity leave. So that was something that uh, made me so nervous. So once my son was born, we really were like, look, we got to pick up this online selling just to supplement our income. So I invested a little bit of money, I think maybe just a couple hundred dollars in some little girl boutique clothing and some adult boutique clothing and started a Facebook group at that time. Um, The Facebook group was primarily just local people from uh, my town, but it grew pretty quickly and it grew from, you know, a couple hundred girls to over 10,000 women by the, by the time I started back to after my maternity leave. So I was started selling clothing on there. I didn't really sell clothing on eBay or Etsy. It was just mostly through the Facebook group. So I was showing the items. I was PayPal invoicing them. I was shipping the items, all of this at nighttime after I worked my full-time job and after I got my son to bed. Um, so I really didn't sleep much at all in 2013, like that last quarter. And at the end of about November, my husband's like, we cannot continue doing it. It's so manual. We have to start a website. Like this is too manual. You PayPal invoicing people, you going to stamps.com, creating the labels and um, it's just too much. So we are going to start a website. We're going to take the money that we've made the profits from selling on online so far. And we're going to just start this website. So December 31st, January 1st of 2014, um, we kicked off pinkly.com. It was really a right out of the box, horrible website. Like it wasn't good at all. So, so slow site speed, everything. We had no prior experience, but it was like just him and I who did it. And, um, we were like, okay, our goal for the year is $50,000 in revenue that will help pay off our credit card debt and some of our student loans. I'll still work my full-time job. He'll work his full-time job. It's just a side hustle. And um, by month two, we had already hit the 50,000. And then by six months in, we hit a million dollars in revenue. So we, I walked away from my job in April of 2014. It was terrifying. Everybody was like, no, you can't quit your, your job with benefits um, just for an online site. And then my husband walked away from his job in July that same year. And then rounding out in December that year, we hit $4 million in revenue and had seven full-time employees. So all from like just this starting in our house and by the end of year one, having, you know, a team of seven and hitting 4 million in revenue very quickly. Um, In the first seven months, we actually still were in our house too. So like we were packaging the orders up to the very like first million dollars of sales all on my dining room table. Tori, what's funny is your story is almost exactly like mine. We started on eBay we were just selling some handkerchiefs and they were running it all over my house. And then my wife, she, she didn't like her job. Mm-hmm. And when we had our kid, we were like, okay, we want to stay at home with the kids. And we ran everything out of the house. And our goal was actually $50,000 our first year. Also oh, we hit funny. it really quickly. And then my wife was like, okay, we got to start a website. Cause I was making the rounds at this post office, carrying like a car full of boxes and they all knew me and they actually hated me. because they I did I just, <laughs> I'd occupy the line for like a long time, right? 
But it's funny, Let, let's take it back to the beginning. I'm very curious. So where did you source those first clothes for, uh, for Etsy and eBay and, and that Facebook group? Yeah, so we, um, I worked with some vendors out of LA to get some products and um, mostly um, for eBay. I think one of the biggest things we had that sold in 2013 were bubble necklaces. So a lot of jewelry really did mm -hmm. well on eBay. Same with Etsy. Um, so Etsy, I also monogrammed on the side, like too. I was like, well, I'm going to buy a monogram machine. We do that monogram. too. <laughs> yeah. So that yeah. was very time consuming. I realized that was not the best use of my time. I sold that monogram machine. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of like scarves and jewelry mostly. And I, I sourced them from, you know, places, uh, LA, China, the fashion Korea, districts or do it fashion. The LA, the, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. And then these were not with your brand on them though, right? These are just already right. made. Okay. Yes. Uh, already to sell uh, turnkey products. Yeah. So how does one grow a Facebook group so quickly, actually? So you mentioned in the beginning, it was just Kentucky folks, right? Mm -hmm. How did you attract other people? So I think at the time, of course, the timing was great for Facebook. And um, it was, you know, back before the it shifted where now it's more paid placement. It was very organic back then. So it was easy. But I also have a social media um, degree or I have a marketing degree. So social mm -hmm. media was always something that I loved. And I learn it as quickly as I can when a new platform comes out. So Facebook was something that I knew very well. And I knew certain strategies of how to grow it, you know, build it as a community, you know, do fun giveaways, get women excited about the product, do the live videos or the, the photos, you know, and um, kind of just go off what works well. If you see that this photo is getting a lot of response, continue to do photos similar to that style and um, just kind of like taking it it was very scrappy too. And I think that people loved it. It wasn't like this put together beautiful photo. It was literally like an iPhone photo of me in my house wearing the product. And I think women just could relate to that a little easier than just that, you know, your typical models that you see on Victoria's Secret or places like that type sites. So were people just finding your group through word of mouth or were you mm -hmm. advertising? It's just word of mouth. It was okay. a group, so it wasn't, you couldn't do paid ads for a group at right. the time. Um, uh -huh. So it was really just like by having people add more people to the group. So can you kind of walk me through, like how often were you posting and how did you build a community? So I would post several times a day. I think that's the strategy too with uh, any good social media platform is to make sure you're consistent with your posting. Mm -hmm. um, but building the community, I was always on there. So even while I was working my full-time job, I was answering girls' questions and they felt like they could ask me, hey, how would you style this? Or what would you recommend size I go with? And really to like give them that personal shopping experience almost from the very beginning. And um, to also like allow them to 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 tell me what they wanted to buy and what they were looking for for us to carry and such. So really to listen to them and always put them first um, really helped to elevate it. And that's kind of been behind um, the brand since the very beginning as we always put the customers first and foremost. So were you going live in your group or was live available back then? Probably not, so right? Live wasn't available back when it very first started, but it quickly became available. So yeah, we, we've been doing live since the beginning of live creation. <laughs> So is that Facebook. Facebook group still around? Are you still active in the group or? So that group, no, it, um, I closed it down after we started Pink Lily and then we started a Pink Lily uh, group right after. And the, our Pink Lily group has, I think, 120,000 women in, in, in that private group. Nice. So our sales, I, I imagine since you have a website now, you don't do sales directly into the group, but is that a way to like showcase new products and get feedback? Yeah. So we do it. Um, we showcase products, but um, we also definitely get feedback on like, what are you wanting for us to buy for fall? Or, you know, what kind of styles would you like us to carry? Um, and really giving them more of that, um, that inside behind the scenes feel. Mm -hmm. But also the biggest thing that does so well in our group is we allow all of our customers to post their own photos. Mm -hmm. So all of them are actually running the group for us by posting content because they're excited to share what the dress looks like on them or their outfit. And then all these women are supportive on them saying, oh, you look great. And how does this fit? And they're answering questions and they're, commun they're communicating together on this group. Um, and it, it works really well that way for us. Cool. So are the moderators of the group just super fans of your brand for the most part? Yes, we okay. actually have most of them are workers here. And then, yes, it, it, anyone is allowed to post in the group. We approve it. We approve it here internally. Right. 
Nice. Okay, so you go from this Facebook group. It gets out of hand because you're manually invoicing everyone. You start this site. It, it looks bad. It's slow. How do you get your first sales on your site? Is it just driving through the group to the site? Yeah. So at that time, right after we launched the Facebook or the website, we launched a Facebook page and that's where primarily most of the sales would came through in year one was all through Facebook. So I did not have any knowledge of Google ads. I have no knowledge of anything else. Uh, Instagram really wasn't big yet. Um, Pinterest probably some too, actually, we did go viral on Pinterest a few times our first year. So Pinterest and Facebook were those key drivers. Um, the Facebook page, I did start doing paid ads on there by the end of January, 2014. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I kind of taught myself all of that with, um, not having background knowledge on any like paid placement, paid social. Right. Right. So, but to go from, did you say you went, you hit 4 million in that first year, you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so how does one go from just a couple hundred thousand to, to four million? Is that is that ads or is it just the size of your group? Like, how do you grow exponentially like that so quickly? So I do think ads was a little bit of it, but okay. I think we were very lucky on our timing too and to have things go viral on Facebook and on Pinterest that year. So we had one photo of a cardigan that had over 700,000 repins on it, like after it okay. launched and we sold all 300 in a day. And that was just luck of the nature. You know, it's really hard now to go viral. And so I do try to explain that because eight years ago, social media and today's social media, sure, did. Of course. but you can, you still can go to TikTok and go viral. There still are opportunities. Um, so we just, you know, had those few moments and then we kind of played off of it from there. You know, we did spend a little bit of money in ads and I don't know the exact amount, sure. but it was very little and it wasn't, um, it was really just curating that community on the Facebook group and being very consistent with social media. So most, so I would say year one and two, most of the sales were organic sales. Okay. And then in terms of product sourcing, uh, did you have like a steady factory at that point or were you still just kind of sourcing stuff from the fashion district and whatnot? So yeah, no years one through three all came from LA fashion district. It was not, we did not have any factories. We still don't have our own factory. We do work with manufacturers now versus, um, you know, paying as much wholesale. Um, we still work both ways, but yeah, we, um, I would go to fashion district up until, you know, 2016, even I think 2017, we uh, it all came from there. So when you go to the fashion district, you can say, Hey, I want you to sew my label on there. Right. And make adjustments. Yes. Correct. And, yeah. Uh, it's been a while since I've been there. I mean, we, we did shop there also. Uh, the minimum order requirements are generally lower there also, right. Depending on who you find. Yeah. Um, but we got to a point quickly by 2016, 2017, that we were needing three to 400 per style that we carry. So we hit them very easily. Yes. The order requirements are very low, but the more you buy, the, the more willing to work on pricing with you. Yeah. I mean, one of the challenges of clothing also is the sizing and the return rate. How do you, how do you deal with that early on? So sizing will still always be the biggest issue. And we're still trying to figure out the best way to overcome that. One of the, some of the couple recent changes in the last two years have been um, having several different size models on the site and then also doing videos that explain how the item fits. So the sizing will always be the number one issue because it's very hard to know your size when you're shopping online. Um, but we definitely have implemented new strategies the last two years by having several size models and then also to do videos on the site that try to explain the fit. So if they should size up or size down or stick with their true size um, in a size chart. In the beginning, I will say it was probably the number one reason of returns was this just didn't fit me. So yeah. um, it, it's always going to be a battle with clothing online, but um, there's hopefully even in the near future, more things that come out on helping women to and men too, to, to really understand what size that they should buy before purchasing. How much money did you start with? Uh, and did you invest into Pink Lily when it launched? So when we launched the site, we had been selling on eBay and Etsy for about 
um, in that Facebook group for about six months. And I think we had about $10,000 in our bank account just saved aside from all of the, the profits to reinvest. So we started very little, like a couple hundred dollars for eBay. And we'd always reinvest the money and put 100% of the profits back into the account to, to grow the inventory. So when we started pinkfully.com, we had about 10,000. We, I think, spent $500 on the website. And then the remainder all went to um, inventory to launch. So we had, you know, a small selection of clothing to, you know, I think 20 to 30 styles when we launched. Wow. Okay. So 10 grand for 20 to 30 styles. That means it's not that many units of each. Right? No, when, at the very yeah. beginning, I would get like one pack, like maybe six units per style. And so it was basically up to you to, to understand and know what was going to sell, right? Or did you just buy that many styles to see what would sell and then focus on your winners? What was your strategy? So I didn't really have a strategy. I kind of just would buy what I personally would wear and okay. what I thought would sell well and then go off trend. So it, back in the day in 2014, like Chevron was huge. So, okay, I sold a Chevron Maxi. It did really well. It sold out so fast. So then I would turn around and used all of the profits to buy five more Chevron Maxis. So I kind of played off what was selling well to, to turn around and buy more product in that same area scope to see if it continued to do well. And when did you start introducing models for your clothes? I mean, that costs money, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, immediately. So we oh, when immediately, we launched, okay. Yeah, when we launched, we launched with models. Um, we did some flat lays, but typically the clothing for us sold better on a model. Yeah. So where did you find the talent? And um, was that a huge investment on your part to hire these models for photo shoots? No, um, we found the talent. We have a college here in town and um, we found the talent just by, I actually looked on Instagram and I was like, I'm going to DM a few girls, see if they're interested. I did all of the photography in the beginning for the, about the wow. first eight months too. Um, it took most of my time doing every single job but then yeah. we hired a full-time photographer i think by august of our first year and we've had now we have i think three full-time photographers we have like seven models that are here most days and um yeah it is an expense but for us it, it it's always necessary was worth yeah it. it was always worth it that's amazing so you bootstrap with ten thousand dollars that's amazing for, for clothing yeah yeah um what does your husband do okay kind of since I, i'm a husband and wife team also and yeah yeah, you know, she's kind of like the face of the company because I, I, I can't talk about handkerchiefs or you know that sort of thing. What is what is what is his role? So his role is he is the president of the company. He oversees all of the operations side, the HR side, and the finance. So he has a degree in finance and his MBA. So that's his specialty. Um, but he also did logistics at his previous uh, corporate world. So he has a lot more operation knowledge than I do. So we kind of split. I'm over product, over customer service. I'm over marketing, face of the brand. He's on the back half of it on the operation side and the HR, all the, the harder stuff. But um, it's it's all hard but it's stuff that it's just like people don't always understand like the back end of a business yeah no that totally makes sense actually in the beginning when my wife and i worked together uh closely we kind of overlapped in our roles and we just kept clashing and fighting and it wasn't oh, until yeah. we separated everything out uh and things are good now but it took a while for us to get there yeah we don't overlap very much at all um, <laughs> yeah, there's really not a lot since i'm on the the product development and marketing side he has not much to do other than money that's about it. That's really the only like, okay, here's your marketing budget for the month. And I'm like, no, we need more. And he's like, no, you can't go over this amount. And so that's about the only thing that we really have a lot of like uh, conversations on, but we have demand planning and, and forecasters now. So he's out of that and budget, you know, a finance team that sets the budget. So he's, he just oversees them now. It's not him setting the budget. Right. Right. Yeah. So you're growing really fast. And I, I know that when you grow fast, it's extremely uncomfortable. You, it seemed like you were switching out warehouses like every year or less. Mm -hmm. um, walk me through that time, if you will. Um, things were growing fast. What were the first things that you were implementing in terms of infrastructure uh, during that growth period? Yeah, so our first warehouse, what we thought was a warehouse, we moved into in July of 2014. It was 1,500 square feet. So we're like, oh yeah, this is huge. At least it's out of our house. And we quickly realized it was way too small. And um, by the November of 2014, we found a 3,000 square foot warehouse and we moved the week before Black Friday. 
Um, so what? we did have, um, we had a one year lease on the first one, but we were like, you know what, it makes sense just to go ahead and move. We need more space to grow. Otherwise we're going to be stuck at this smaller amount. So we moved and by 2015, we were like, we still need more than 3000 square feet. So my husband and I bought this, the land right up the road. It was two acres and started, uh, building our uh, current warehouse facility. So we bought it in 2015, we built 25,000 square foot warehouse and completed that in 2016. We added on an additional 25,000 square feet by 2018. And then by 2019, we're like, we have to have another warehouse. So we bought or we rent, rent sign the lease on one right up the road. That's 160,000 square feet. So last year, wow. 2020, Black Friday, we were actually operating out of both and trying to like make shift up there just for more room. Um, but we currently are operating out of both warehouses. Your your offices are in Kentucky, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Only in Kentucky. Okay, good. In California, that would have been like a hundred million dollars. Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. Wow. No. So I, I gather Kentucky. Not that much here. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so when you were scaling also. Uh, so the where how many SKUs are we talking about when you moved into that first 1500 warehouse? Like what was all the room for? Was it just inventory? Were you carrying yeah. inventory or was stuff made on demand? It or? was a lot of inventory for girls to work. At that time, we were hiring people to come in and package orders. So they're not doing it on my dining room table. So we had like packaging stations and we also had all the inventory stored there too. Oh, wow. Okay. So you don't use a third party logistics firm or anything. You're still fulfilling all of your orders. Yeah, we, we do not do 3PLs. We do um, all of it fulfillment too. Wow. Okay. So that, can you just walk me through what your facility looks like? Is there like conveyor belts like amazon.com where, where boxes come down and you have these automated stations or? So they did quote that it was going to be about $20 million to put oh, in. We're not doing that. Um, yeah. So we do have um, some really cool things, but we don't have conveyor belts. Um, we have like our inbound, you know, they have, they receive the boxes, they put the way the boxes, we have overflow, we have really high racking. Um, so we, you know, we have those little things that they go up on the, whatever they're called. And then yeah. um, um, we have about, we have a day shift and a night shift. So we are operating seven days a week out um, pretty much, I think 20, 20 something hour, they're 10 hour shift. So 20 hours a day, the yeah. warehouse is open. And um, I think that they, the SKU count currently is about 13,000 SKUs. 13,000. Wow. Okay. Can you walk me through just like the calculations and going 3PL versus owning your own warehouse? So I, they're still doing a lot of deep diving into that and it's not out of the question in the future. The hard part is with 3PLs. It works very well if you have less SKUs. The mm -hmm. more SKUs you have, especially being more of a fast fashion brand, it's a yeah. lot harder for them. So for us, it makes, I think, in the long run makes sense to keep our fulfillment. Um, but 3PLs, you know, they work very well when you have a limited SKU, you know, if you're only selling 10, 20, 30 products and you're always replenishing those, makes sense. But yeah. if you're changing out styles every season, it doesn't really make that much sense yet. So Actually, yeah, walk me through that side of the business. So once something goes out of season, are you stuck with the inventory or what, what do you do with the inventory when it goes out of style? Yeah. So one thing that, especially with our brand is we're not too trendy and that we do that on that, that reason. If there's a trend that hits the, the market now, but in two months it could be gone. Like that doesn't really resonate very well with me because I don't want to invest in something that I'm going to just toss out of my closet two months yeah. from now, you know? So like our pieces are more staple that can last for years versus it being so trendy. We do occasionally have some trends that we want to test out, um, but again, if you go to our site, it's really a little bit for, um, we offer so much for everyone, but it's not super, super trendy. It's just good classic styles. But there is that case where you, you do have inventory that you're sitting on and the trend goes out, say tie dye 2020 was huge. And then we didn't sell all the way through tie dye. And then the, the, the trend quickly died. So at that point we work really hard on, you know, what kind of sales do we need to put it in? What kind of liquidation process do we need? We have once a year, typically we do an in-person uh, warehouse sale where people can come shop items, very discounted, um, and then the clearance as well. So we do have a clearance section on the site, sale section, and those are typically for styles that are, um, you know, maybe there are 20 or less left in stock or they're just out of season and we are not carrying them in the future. So we just want to discount them to get them out the door. 
When did you start designing your own clothes? Are you a designer, clothing designer? I am not a designer. I have okay. ideas, but I am not like an actual designer. So sure. um, we started working with our vendors um, in LA and then some in China and Korea back in, I think about 2018 okay. on our own ideas. Um, so from there, it's transitioned very quickly with manufacturing our own items. And uh, we're currently actually hiring for a full-time designer, but um, I'm not one myself. <laughs> so, I mean, you're the brains though, right? I mean, you know what's trendy. So walk me through, like, how, how do you design without being a designer? So I'll look for concepts. I see things that do well within, again, it goes back back to the very beginning, like what sells well on the site? What are people loving and keep continually playing off that? If there is something that they love, let's innovate it. Let's make it, you know, newer for next year, but let's keep the same concept of it. You know, if there's an animal print maxi dress that every single time we restock it, it sells out. Let's, let's take that and let's come up with three more animal print designs. Let's work on that. So I, I see things that I like and I put them together in my head or on a horrible Photoshop. Like uh -huh. here's the idea for the, the swimsuit, but I cannot draw at all. And I do not know AutoCAD at all. So yeah, yeah. I do work with our graphic designer here and she'll draw prints. And, um, you know, I do oversee a lot of that with her. Um, but we also, we, um, we know our customer pretty well. So it's like, we know what they love and we continue just to play off what they want. And so if you're working with like a designer, I imagine it takes multiple iterations before like the stitching and this, I mean, there's only so much they can do from a picture, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot of different fit samples and a lot of like proto samples that it takes two or three rounds. Okay. Wow. This just sounds, I mean, running a clothing business just sounds so much more complicated. It is very um, complicated. Looking back, I'm like, maybe I should have started something <laughs> else, but it's okay. I love that because I wear clothes every day and so yeah. does everybody else. So it is a necessity. Um, and the way of the world is, you know, turning to shopping online, which is great for the sure. future. But yeah, it is, it is very complicated. Of those 13,000 SKUs, how many would you say kind of turn over in a given year? We do it four to five turns a year on our in complete inventory. But in terms of like the styles that kind of go obsolete or that you're, you're taken down, um, you mentioned you had staples and then you had new styles. Of those 13,000, how many of those are just kind of staples that, that just lasted the, the test of time? So for our staples, we still don't always keep them in stock. We do let them run out and then restock them at the season that they are appropriate for. Mm. There's some staples like body suits if they're long sleeves we may not have them in stock in may and june so we do still let them sell out at times and um, so i would say 90 percent of our business turns and it's not a stable wow. goal okay. would be maybe getting it to maybe 40 percent 60 one day but yeah most of our stuff is it it turns amazing okay so all right so where we left off was you're at four million dollars how do you go from four to a hundred i mean so what, what were the primary drivers for growing you know past you know nine figures. Yeah. So for 14, 15, 16, we grew, you know, four to 12 million. We kind of stayed at 12 million for a year or two, just because we kept outgrowing our space. And we, it sure. was just my husband and I, it was our money, you know? So like we reinvested all the profits, but we didn't like put additional in to continue to scale. Um, so by 2016, we started working outside of just Facebook and Instagram. We started doing more paid ads influencers we introduced those influencer partnerships i think in 2018 which really helped elevate and in 2019 we uh, teamed up with a minority investor company and they really helped elevate you know and scale we started building out our teams um, with director level because at the time it was still my husband and i doing mm -hmm. most of the work so they invested in um you know director level positions and really um, those positions helped us elevate even faster. You know, our director of e-com, our warehouse director, um, our marketing director and such. So um, by, you know, getting a little bit of expertise on board by 2019, that really helped us go from, you know, 30 million to a hundred million within two years. Was that just all online or was that due to, are you in retail outlets? We have one retail store here in our town and it is under a million a year. So it's very small okay. since we are just a, a college town. It's not like a big city. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's a very small amount of revenue. Okay. So it's, it's all online sales that mm -hmm. you scaled and it was, it sounds like it was scaled through mostly just paid advertising, Facebook uh, and Instagram, I would imagine. 
yeah, paid advertising and yeah, pretty much. What's uh, are you guys on TikTok? We are. Yes. How's that? How's that going for you guys? So um, TikTok is it's great to for like legion, but it's not great for building the community. So we are consistent on there. And I think we have about 150,000 followers. Um, we were one of the first brands to jump on there quickly because anytime a, a platform uh, arises, I'm very quick to like make sure that our brand's on there and have people are, know about us and see us. Um, but people don't respond to brands as well on TikTok. So we're still trying to learn to navigate that. Um, but yeah, we do have 150,000 followers. We just try to get them over to Instagram or get them to our email list. You know, we've run some TikTok ads that, you know, they go to it and it, it signs them up for our email newsletter. That's a key driver to get them to actually shop. Yeah, speaking among my colleagues, it seems like people will find you on TikTok, but you have to drive them to either your own site, get their email or Instagram to actually complete the sale. Exactly. Yes. Um, it is a good for lead gen, but not really for conversion. Yeah. Are you guys on YouTube also, or is it just, yeah, social? we have a YouTube. We really pushed it last year um, until it just bandwidth. We couldn't um, keep yeah. up with keep making the videos every single week. It was really more behind the scenes on the brand side though, than uh, like product, which people love. They love seeing, you know, the behind the scenes of the brand. Yeah. What is your philosophy of you personally being in the posts are, are you still in a lot of the posts that you're in either TikTok or or Instagram? So TikTok, not really, um, or Instagram. I mean, they'll repost photos that I get and uh, share and stuff. But um, for sure, YouTube behind the brand more so, mm -hmm. and like behind the scenes stuff. But I'm not like the model. You know, we do. They do have TikTok models and and photographers and such that. And I honestly just don't have the time to go to all these photo shoots and do that part of it too. Yeah, no, I was I was just wondering. So that transition probably took place once you cross like eight figures, I would imagine, right? And you could hire a whole bunch more people to handle everything. Right. Yeah. We yeah. I did a lot of the live videos for the first few years and people really did um enjoy, you know, seeing the CEO do the videos. And I would love to do more of those live videos on Facebook, but it's just it, right now I'll leave it to the marketing team to do it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to I, I know you're a mom and you have three kids, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. how does one, I know we have some problems doing this. How does one juggle three kids with running such a large business? Um, with help for sure. Okay. Um, so my, we have a, uh, our two of our older ones are in school, but then my two year old, she has a, a babysitter that comes during the day. So we come into work while she is at home with her babysitter. Um, if we ever have to travel, she'll stay the night too. She's great. Um, but my husband is really good too. Like we, we both are great parents versus it just being like the mom's role or the dad's role. Yeah. So, um, we tag team a lot. And um, if I have to work late, it's he'll go home at four and let our babysitter go and like he'll cook dinner and such. So, um, it is a lot at times where it's so much at work and then you can't get your work done and you have to do it. But I try really hard to, you know, four to eight o'clock is kids time. We play, yeah. we do baths, we do that. And then if I have to finish working, I'll do that after I get the kids to bed to, to complete the emails for the day. Yeah. I, I, so your kids are younger than mine. M mine are um, teenage years now. And I feel like I'm a full-time driver starting at one o'clock on. <laughs> uh, I can't even imagine. Uh, so, so I, I, my, my work hours, I work from about seven until about noon or one o'clock. And then the whole yeah. afternoon is just devoted to me being like a glorified Uber driver. Like I go to all the <laughs> practices, I coach and that sort of thing. Uh, can you walk me through your typical day? Actually, I'm very curious. Yeah. Yeah. So in the morning it is wake up, get the kids ready for uh, school, do my daughter's hair. Um, they're on the, they just started riding the bus like two weeks ago. They're super excited about it because we nice. moved into our district so they could ride the bus. I don't know why they, they begged to ride the bus, but I was like, I hated the bus when I was a kid. But, I did too, actually. Yeah. Um, they <laughs> ride the bus and they like it. So I'll get them out the door. My husband does too. And then um, we play with our two-year-old for just a little bit before her babysitter gets there. And then I will come into work. I'm still working on, we just recently moved. I'm still working on getting my home office so I can actually work at home some. Um, but our it looks warehouse, nice. Uh, I'm our warehouse back, is right? just a mile away. So it's oh, not okay. hard to get here. Okay. Um, so come in and I'm typically here every day from eight to four or eight to okay. five, depending on the day. Uh huh. And then go home. We have right now, this is a crazy season. We've got soccer, we've got cheerleading and baseball. So every single night there is an activity for a kid to get to. Yes. Um, and so spring, especially it's a little harder, but that nights are usually either driving one of them and staying out of practice or staying home with the other two kids and feeding them dinner, cooking them, all that stuff. It's nuts. So, um, for, so from 
you said nine to four, you're at work. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are your primary duties at work right now? I am over so many things. So <laughs> I basically oversee all the products. So I'm over the buying team The we just recently hired a director of merchandising. So she's still learning the ropes. Um, I have to work on with them and demand planning to ensure we're hitting the numbers that we need to hit on the sell through percentages on our inventory coming in. I also oversee the marketing team. So I work with them directly, the marketing director on um, just strategies and overall implementation for marketing. Also oversee the customer service team to ensure the, the CSAT scores are going up and you know everything that all customers are satisfied. And then from there, if there's other ever other issues that are, arise or just things like um, today, I'm this afternoon going over to the warehouse just to see new new things that we're doing and um, dealing with some issues with new contracts for our ambassadors and influencers, et cetera. So hands in a lot of different things at all times. <laughs> Tori, that, that made me tired just hearing you say all that stuff, actually. Yeah, I do I, stay pretty tired <laughs> at night, Tom. I'm like, okay, I need to go to bed. You probably sleep very well. I do, um, yes. <laughs> okay, so I, I want to kind of shift this last part of the interview towards people. Like, so as I mentioned before, I run a class and, and oftentimes people want to sell apparel. So mm -hmm. I want... I want your advice here. So whenever someone asks me to, to sell, whether they should sell apparel, I usually say no, mm -hmm. because I think it's just going to be extremely difficult, but you right. clearly pulled it off on a bootstrap budget. What advice would you give people who actually want to go the apparel route? I would say at this time and age, eight years post when I started, total different world, obviously now with clothing and, you know, even things like Amazon fashion was not a thing when I started. So um, I would say the only way for it to be successful at this point in time would just find a gap in the market of something not being sold. So that's going to be like, if there is an idea that you have, you know, I've seen great brands pop up like Viore, you know, they sell um, really good lounge wear and such. And they are a huge brand that just popped up, you know, a few years ago, but they had that gap in the market and there wasn't great lounge wear and everybody who's staying home and they wanted that stuff. So, um, to really look to see what the, that gap is. And, um, you know, I, I agree on trends changing way too fast. I think if you go that route, you may not be successful. I would th think it's going to be much more successful if you have classic styles that work for people long term. And also even going into the the route that, you know, we're trying to go in the future is just having a sustainable clothing line. That could be something huge, you know, if you want yeah. to start out that right now. Have you guys had problems with knockoffs? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we always have issues with that. And even as far as graphic tees and graphic designs, you know, that we do on our ours that our graphic designer hand draws, then we see it all over Etsy a month later. So yeah. um, yes, we we always have issues with that. What would you say like a good starting budget would be for someone new who wants to go into apparel? Do you think it's possible to bootstrap it just like you guys did mm -hmm. today? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm always uh, in favor of walking before you run. Sure. With, you know, that so. And where would you start in terms of marketing? Would you start with influencers? Would you start on social? What, what would you do if you start all over again? Right now, I would do both. I would start, you know, definitely with uh, influencers and, you know, TikTok and Instagram, social media. I think that there's still a lot of life left in some of those uh, platforms. And there's also new platforms always starting up. So um, a lot of women have, or a lot of boutique owners that I know have great success with both of those, especially TikTok right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, take some dance lessons, throw up some TikToks. Yeah, like start dancing and showing uh, how <laughs> you're to do great. Uh, what's your influencer strategy? What do you find? So out? we work with a variety of influencers. Um, we really, we ensure that we're getting a good ROI on them though. So, I mean, it does um, take a lot of like after the fact, here's what they are posting. Here's what this, what sold. Here's what their coupon code brought in for us to be able to rebook them. You do have to bring in a certain ROI, but our strategy, it's really, um, it's ever changing because the influencer world is always. Yeah. always where where do you find them? Are, do you look on Instagram primarily? Yeah. So we were Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. We work with all influencers on all those platforms. So do you give them like a trial? Like you mentioned ROI, but it's, it's really hard to figure out whether someone's going to be ROI positive, right? So, Most influencers don't do a trial. It's just, you know, they're. Well, you know, so what I meant by that is do you cast your net wide and then and figure out who, who works and then just focus yeah. on those. Yeah. Okay. I think if you're starting out now, that's exactly what I would do. Do you focus on the smaller or are you guys looking at bigger people or? 
Uh, so for us, it's a, it's a really good mix. The ones that really drive the conversion and the sales are the bigger girls. Um, but it's very hard to book larger girls. And it's also very expensive to book larger girls. Yeah, so yeah. I think if you take the money and split it um, amongst smaller ones, you're going to get a whole lot more new audiences. And in the long run, it can be better for just that top of funnel marketing. So uh, what do you negotiate as like the deliverables? I mean, obviously you're not, sometimes one post isn't enough, right? So what, what is your typical like minimum book for them to post for you? Um, usually it is just one post just and one post. A, like a, a story session too. I mean, there's definitely some that we do like, okay, two posts a month and two story sessions, but um, a lot of them like to have a variety of things that they cover on their, their platforms and they don't want to just be like only showing one brand all the time. Interesting. Are you looking for ROI positivity with influencers or do you, I would imagine your repeat customer rates pretty, pretty good, right? Cause you have a closing. We have about a 74% retention rate. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. It's so, very above average. Yeah. That's amazing. So that means you can probably afford to lose money on these influencers, right? Just to get, yeah, we don't though. We, we make sure that we do not lose money on any of our, our um, investments. So we do make sure that we have a positive ROI. Okay. So if you're brand new, would you just recommend going after the small guys where, where you do, you, you do you actually just give away product for the small people and in return for in the past? Yes. In the, past, the way yes. the it's getting harder now. world has changed so much yeah. that very little influencers do it for free product I these know. days. Everyone considers themselves an influencer these I days. I know it's changed right? drastically in the last even two to three years. The way of the world in 2018 with the influencer world is drastically different than it is in 2022. Yeah. Okay. So that sounds like a good overview. So you could probably bootstrap with like 10 grand. If you were doing it all over today, focus on social, maybe TikTok, the free organic methods yeah. and then find some influencers, find out, hopefully try to just give away the product in, in return for some mentions and then just, yeah, for and sure. be social, create a community. Yeah. I think the community is a really big factor. I think that that's the, just the way of the future with online selling overall. And, um, you know, people want to feel like they're, a, my husband's in this bourbon group community and he spends a lot of money in there and it, he's like I love it I'm addicted to it and I feel like people actually do get addicted to these groups and that they want to check it every day and then they're like oh well let me buy that and you know they, they get excited and they want to fill a part of a community you know people are spending less and less real time together so they want to have an alternative and that's a community on social media is Facebook still the best place for communities or have you branched out elsewhere I think a Facebook group is probably still the number one still the number one mm -hmm. okay if you want to see more amazing interviews with successful entrepreneurs, then check out this next interview right here. I think you'll enjoy it and you'll definitely be inspired.